Well, good morning, Austin Oaks Church. Morning. My name is Josh. I'm on staff at the church here. Um, And uh, that was my lovely wife singing this morning. So that was pretty awesome. Um, Actually, something about us. We got married when we were really young, if you knew us back then. Uh, At least by today's standards, we were 20 years old when we got married. So we were engaged at 19 and married at 20. And um, one of the things that we did uh, when we got married our groomsmen gifts that we got for uh, the groomsmen in the wedding. They were matching sets of ties and Converse sneakers. So uh, you'd get like this bright colored tie and these bright colored Converse to wear to the wedding. And uh, if I remember correctly, it was like one of them was green and one of them was brown and one of them was yellow. It was a long time ago, so <laughs> I don't quite remember what uh, colors they were, but they looked, they looked great. And uh, as for me, I had my suit picked out. Um, I wore a white tie, which to this day I still don't understand, but my wife wanted me to wear it, so I did. Um, But I kid you not, I woke up the morning of my wedding and it dawned on me that I had never even thought about what shoes I was going to wear to my own wedding. Um, So I was kind of in a a scramble, again, 20 years old, so it was apartment life. I was living with my older brother. Uh, I worked at a coffee shop, so the only thing I cared about shoes was like so that they were non-slip while I was, you know, doling out coffee. Uh, So I grabbed the nicest pair of shoes that I had, but they were probably like $20 Walmart shoes. Um, And so if you look back on those pictures from my wedding, you'll see the groomsmen, they look great. And uh, I just kind of cringe because I'm like, yeah, I, I, those are not, uh, not very appropriate shoes to wear to a wedding. And I was the groom. Um, but there you go. I just felt really stupid because I hadn't prepared for my own wedding, at least not there. Now, obviously, I still did end up getting married, right? And the important things were checked. Um, we went through a a lot of pretty intensive uh, premarital counseling. So we had a lot of good um, preparation in that way. But I still, you know, just thinking back, I'm still embarrassed. And no one has said anything to this day. I don't think anyone has pointed out my shoes were not uh, appropriate. Like these are probably nicer shoes than the ones that I wore to my own wedding. Um, But I still did end up getting married. Um, But it just... I'm embarrassed when I think back on it. And I think that just goes to show that when you don't properly prepare for something, yeah, it could still go well, right? It still ended up happening. I still ended up getting married. Um, But I wasn't able to, when you don't prepare, you're not able to get everything out of it that there is, right? You're kind of leaving money on the table. Or in my case, you just end up feeling really stupid for years and years and years, when you think back on, you know, one of the biggest days of my life. Kind of dumb. Uh, But anyways, what does this this dumb story have anything to do with what we're going to be talking about this morning? This morning, we're going to be talking about preparing for worship. Uh, And so what does it mean to prepare to come before God? Uh, Well, when I think about preparation, I, I think you have to understand before you get into the nuts and bolts of, of, of preparing for something, you have to understand its purpose, right? Um, say you're going to a basketball game, okay? Your, your preparation to get ready to go to this basketball game is going to be very different if you're going with your friends, if you're going with your family to watch the game, than say if you were on the basketball team, right? Your preparation would be totally different. It would, for weeks and months leading up to that game, you'd be preparing, So this morning, I want to start by taking a look at the purpose. Why are we here? What are we doing here? What what is it that we do when we come to worship God corporately together? Uh, And I I know, actually, we've we've kind of talked about that a lot lately, right? This series is about true worship. It's about what we're doing here. Um, But I found a story in Exodus 19 that that I think shows us really well what it means to prepare and what it means when we come before God in worship. So we're going to start there this morning. So if you don't mind, I'd like to pray and then we can dive into Exodus chapter 19. So God, as we open your word, we pray that you would speak it to us. We pray, God, that you would be working. We know that you are. 
and we pray that we would offer up acceptable worship to you because of what you have done on our behalf. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so we are taking a look at Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to start in verse 10. Uh, so just to explain where this story happens, if you know the history of Israel, this is right after Israel was freed from their captivity in Egypt. So, you know, Moses let my people go. They left the fair. They crossed the Red Sea. If you've seen the Prince of Egypt, that whole story. Um, Exodus 19 happens three months after that. They're in the desert. And um, uh, Exodus 20, so the next chapter, is where God gives the Ten Commandments. So this is right before that. This is God saying that he's going to come to Israel in a special way, and he's going to give them the law. So starting in verse 10, here's what it says. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So here, God gives his people a timeline. He says, on the third day, I'm going to show up. I'm going to come before you. My presence is going to be with you in a very special way. Up to that point, he'd revealed himself in different ways. But God wants to be with his people. And so he is going to descend onto Mount Sinai in this very special way. And he, and he says, I'm going to give you three days. I'll be there on the third day. So you have two days to prepare for this when my presence will be among you in this way. And so he says to get ready. You have two days to get ready. And he says to cleanse yourselves, to wash your garments, wash your clothes. And God isn't just saying to take a shower, right? As we see, it's, it's much more than that. So let's look at the next verse. Verse 12 says, uh, let's see. And you shall set limits for the people all around, all around the mountain, saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. So wow, that escalated quickly, right? It goes from wash yourself to you could die. And, and this isn't just the people. It actually um, goes into detail. This is animals or people. Whoever approaches this mountain in an unworthy uh, way will die. And, and this isn't arbitrary either. This isn't God just trying to show off how powerful he is. No, he's actually coming to his people because he wants to be with them, right? He wants to dwell with his people. He wants them to come to him. But at the same time, he's saying, if you come in an unworthy way, you could die. Uh, just previous, uh, jumping back up to verse 5, God makes this explicit that this is about a relationship. Because he calls Israel, he says, now therefore, if you will, you know what? I, I might have gotten the wrong verse here, but uh, okay, half, yeah, it's halfway through that verse. Sorry about that. So God actually says that you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Among all the peoples, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. For the whole earth is mine. God is saying, all of the peoples of the earth are mine, but you are my special treasured possession. I want to be in relationship with you. So when he comes on Mount Sinai, he's not trying to kill anyone, but he's warning them that my holiness, if you approach me, in this way, you could die. Because God is so good that at his presence, evil will be destroyed, right? Justice will occur because God is so good. And so if we come knowing that our hearts are evil, we could be destroyed in his very presence as well. And that's why he says to the people, cleanse yourselves, wash yourselves. It's this, this picture of washing away the evil 
So then we see in chapter 19, starting in verse 16, this is the manifestation of God's descent upon Mount Sinai. Again, it's not, it's not a full picture of what it looks like when God is there, but it's this very special way in which his presence is going to be and dwell with his people. Starting in verse 16, it says, On the morning of the third day, There was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. So picture this scene. Put yourself there. Okay, you've been preparing. Finally, you go to this mountain. You know you might die if you approach this mountain. But now God calls you to go before the mountain, and you see fire descend. You see smoke billowing up. You see there's a trumpet blast. I mean, it's an absolute assault on all of your senses. It says the people are trembling in fear. There's an earthquake as well going on. And this is the God that we serve, right? This is his, his power, his presence. It burns like fire. It makes the ground shake. There's a trumpet blast when he speaks. He speaks in thunder. And there's billows of smoke as well because of the fire of his presence. Um, Later, the prophet Joel speaks about the return of Jesus, and he calls it the great and terrible day of the Lord. Because we see the power of our God, we see the holiness of our God, We see who we are when we come before him as well. It's a dangerous thing to come before a holy God. And and we see this all throughout the Bible. We see this even in the Old Testament priests. So later after they set up the temple and they they perform these, these sacrificial rituals, um, there was this practice that, that happened when they set up the temple. There's um, this room called the, the room, well, it's where they, they performed sacrifices. It's where the priests performed their sacrifices. And within that room in the temple, there was uh, wall, not walled off, but it was um, separated off another room that was called the most holy place, the holy of holies. And that was the place where God said that he would dwell with his people. Just like in this picture of Mount Sinai, God was there in the holy of holies and it was separated from the rest of the temple. No human could enter that room. It was separated by um, what they call a veil. Now, when we think of a veil, we think of like sheer garment and it's not that at all. The veil in the temple was about four inches thick. So it's this huge sheet that was hung to separate from where the people would be, even where the priests would give sacrifices to God, to where God dwelt in a very special way among his people. And I said earlier, no human was allowed there. There was one time a year when someone could actually go into the Holy of Holies. The high priest was allowed to go in there on a day called the Day of Atonement. And when he went in there, crossing that that veil, going beyond that veil, he brought with him a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the people, to atone for his own sins. And he brought with him incense so that the smoke would obscure his vision so he wasn't seeing God face to face. And the scripture says, God was actually pretty particular about what the high priest would wear. Um, The scripture says that on his garments, he would wear bells. And uh, the Bible actually specifically says to wear these bells so that he would not die. Now, tradition says that the rest of the priests would stand outside the Holy of Holies and listen in. Because if they heard those bells, they knew that the high priest was still alive. He was He was giving his sacrifices. You could hear him moving in there. But if they stopped hearing those bells, then they would know that the priest had died because he had gone into the Holy of Holies. He had gone before God uh, in an unworthy way. So we see this all throughout the scripture that when God's presence is near, um, there's an element of danger. 
because of how holy our God is. There's a chance of death. But that being said, don't let that keep you away this morning. God wants a relationship with you. He wants to know you personally. Because that veil that I talked about, that sheet that separated God from his people, that veil has been torn. And the scripture talks about this. So uh, Matthew chapter 27, this is when Jesus was crucified, when he gave himself up on our behalf, when he died for our sins, to take away all of our sin and to take away, to make us new creations in him. It says in uh, verse 50, it says, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, he died. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, like I said, this, this curtain, this veil, it was four inches thick. On top of that, different reports say that it was anywhere from 30 to 60 feet tall. So when the Bible says that it was torn from top to bottom, this was impossible for any human to do. This was God himself who tore the veil, saying that now my presence is among you. I don't have to, you, we're no longer separated. It's this picture that God gives that he wants to be with you. He wants to know you personally. Because now, through Christ's sacrifice, we have his righteousness. We don't have to cleanse ourselves the same way that Israel had to. Because those things were pointing towards the perfect sacrifice. Those, those, the atonement that was given, that was pointing towards the death of Jesus to wash us clean, to take away our sins. So rather than, than washing our clothes, rather than taking a shower, we are able to clothe ourselves in the righteousness of Christ so that when God looks upon us, he doesn't see our sin, he doesn't see our failures, he sees Christ's righteousness. He sees the goodness that Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. And now we actually have access to God. Ephesians says that for through him, Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And this is pretty awesome because this scripture actually talks about each person in the Trinity, right? It says that through Jesus, we have access in the Holy Spirit to the Father. So it gives us this picture that this was God's plan from the beginning, that all three persons in the Trinity had, had decided that this is how that he was going to save his people. And now we have access and Hebrews tell, tells us, therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We no longer have to fear. We can come boldly before our God. Just like as a father, I want my children to come boldly into my presence. Our heavenly father wants us to come boldly before him. And look at how the writer of Hebrews describes God's dwelling place. He calls it the throne of grace. And when we think about a throne, we think about the place where the king rules, right? He, and he has every right to rule and, and condemn rebellion, right? He can condemn traitors. But instead, he, the writer calls it the throne of grace where we receive mercy, Right, that place which previously we were terrified at, that God rules over all, now that very same place is where we receive God's good gifts of mercy and grace. And the wonder about all of this is that God has never changed. He is the same. It's our position before him that has changed. We were made righteous through Christ's sacrifice. I think uh, there's another passage in Hebrews I'd like to read that sums this up, that, that holds these things in tension, that we have a holy God, that there is danger when we approach him, and yet at the same time that we can come boldly, that we have access to him. In Hebrews 12, verse 26, it says, at that time, his voice shook the earth, right? Exodus 19, we see that picture He's descended, he, he shook the earth, he came in fire, right? 
Continuing, but now he's promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Therefore, uh, jumping down to verse 28, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He is still all powerful. He is still a dangerous God, but we are his beloved people. We no longer have to, to tremble in fear of death when we approach him. We, we tremble because of the wonder of his grace that he gives us and his kindness and his love for us, right? So knowing all of this, if God is the one who's actually prepared us to enter into his presence, then, then what is there for us to do, right? How, how does this actually inform how we ought to prepare for worship if it's something that God has already done? Well, let me flip the question a little bit and help us, help us think. Because on, on Sunday morning, on Saturday night, whatever it is, do we even treat our Sunday gatherings as something worthy of preparation. When we think about how we're going to church on Sunday morning, do we even think at all that we have to prepare for it, that we have to, to get ready for it? Because God makes it clear, also in Hebrews, um, he makes it clear that something special happens here. Yes, our entire lives are lived in worship to God, yes. But there's something special that happens when we gather together. Hebrews says, uh, God commands us in Hebrews, in fact, not to neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God says that you are an encouragement by being here. You encourage me by being here. You encourage one another, singing together, lifting up our voices in worship, hearing from God, Having him speak to you, you're able to share that with your brothers and sisters here. You are an encouragement, is what God says. And we need this. The Lord says not to neglect this. This is important in your life, in, in growing in the grace and knowledge of God. And look at how this, this gathering together is, is even described. It's not something that you attend, right? It's a gathering. It's us coming together. Worship is participatory. I said it. I didn't stumble on that word. Um, this, isn't, this isn't just a production that's set before you, right? We're not a group of professional Christians that put on a show for you to consume. No, it's so much more than that. This is something that we all do together. You are needed here this morning. And every Sunday, we need you here. When we think about how uh, the Bible describes the church as the body of Christ, we each have our own unique set of skills and gifts and talents and experiences. And we need that. We need to be sharing that. I need that from you to hear from you as well. And I get it, okay? Okay. Just getting practical here. I grew up in a Christian household, so I've been attending church for as long as I can remember. Uh, Sunday morning was always just the morning that you go to church. Um, thank you, Mom. She's in the back of the room, actually. It's uh, due in, in large measure to her influence. Um, but I get it, because it's so easy to just fall back into, oh, it's Sunday morning. Like, that's just what we do. We're supposed to. You know, for lack of a better term, we're good Christians, and so it, it's Sunday. We just attend church, right? Um, sometimes we do that in our small groups, too. Whatever night it is, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's just small group night. That's just when we get together. Um, there, there's a saying that goes, um, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And so when I'm away from my wife or my kids, and I think about them, oh man, I just, I, I want to be with them, right? I'm, I'm very fond of them and I want to be with them. And I think that's beautiful. But I think sometimes the flip side of that is true. 
that familiarity breeds contempt. Sometimes we just become so familiar with the things that we do. Sometimes our attending church is just routine, right? Sometimes our Bible study is just routine. We just do it to do it, to check off the box, to say that we were there. And I don't think I need to tell you this, but that's not worship. That's not worshiping God. The, the verse that we, um, that's been a key verse in this entire series, uh, where we got the title of the series as well, is John 4, 23, and it's Jesus speaking. He says that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So we look at that, worshiping in spirit and in truth. How can you worship in spirit and in truth if you're not engaged? Right, this is something that we need to engage in. Worship is an active event. It's something that you are a part of, something that you're participating in. It's not just uh, sitting back and, and letting it happen to you. It is you actively engaged in worshiping the God of the universe who, again, you have access to, who's here this morning speaking. Ephesians 5 says to, to, to make the best use of our time. It says to make the most out of every opportunity. And that includes what we do here. That includes when we gather together. How can you make the most of what we're doing, of worshiping this God who is altogether holy and who invites us in? Right? So here's just some, some practical things. Okay, we've been looking at who God is and the amazing things that he've done, he's done, but what does that mean for us today? right? In, in 2021, how does this actually affect the way that we, we, we are here? And, and the first thing, I think I've already said it, but it means I would encourage you to just be here now, right? There's so many other things you could be doing, so many things you could be thinking about, so many distractions in this world. But be here, because worship, if we are to worship in spirit and in truth, it means it requires concentration, if we are to truly worship with our minds as well as our hearts, we need to focus on what we're doing. So it means shutting off our distractions. And I will be the first to talk about how this thing distracts me. Okay? I find myself, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching as much to myself this morning as I am to you. I find myself waking up in a stupor in the middle of a sermon sometimes, scrolling through my feeds. What, what am I doing? That's not what I'm here to do, right? If, if you ever go back to the tech booth where I usually am, there's like six different screens in front of you. It's so easy to get distracted in so many other things. So I would encourage you, shut off the distractions as much as you can. Focus, concentrate on worshiping the Lord here this morning. So, and there are other practical things you can do. Right? How about just getting enough sleep? Yeah, the, Tim Keller, I believe it was him, who said that sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to take a nap. And he's just acknowledging the way that our, our body affects the way that we can think, the way that we move in the world. So I have to ask, what are you doing on Saturday night? Are you trying to get enough sleep so that you can be here, so that you can engage along with us in worship together? Right? Are you, uh, again, looking at myself here, staying up till two in the morning playing video games, binge watching Netflix, mindlessly scrolling through feeds? <laughs> uh, what are you doing? Or maybe you're out on the town having a good time, maybe having a little too much to drink. How is that going to affect your Sunday morning? Are you leading yourself actually away from the God that you are about to encounter on Sunday morning, right? Are you hardening your heart towards him with the way that you spend your, Sunday, your Saturday evening or the way that you spend your entire life? And I get it too, I have three young kids, five and under, 
okay? And there's a joke between me and my wife that Saturday nights are the most restless night out of the entire week. It always seems to happen on Saturday nights that my kids have to get up multiple times in the middle of the night to go to the restroom. Maybe they don't make it to the restroom and so we have to clean up their room or maybe they have a stomach issue and you have to clean something else up from their bed. Regardless, it always seems to happen on Saturday night, okay? And I, I get it. That's just the way that life works. But as far as it is up to you, get some rest so that you can be with us here this morning. Um, I want to brag on my wife for just a second, speaking of my kids, because she started doing this. And again, just a really practical thing. She started uh, after we put the kids down on Saturday night just preparing a simple breakfast for them, throwing it in the fridge so it's nice and easy to to pull out for Sunday morning. Um, And laying out their clothes as well on the couch. So as crazy as it gets on Sunday morning, there are at least a few things that'll help the morning go smoothly so that there's less of a chance of a total meltdown on Sunday morning. Sometimes it happens. Um, But along with that, just, just think through your morning. In your stage of life, what does Sunday morning look like, right? How, what is going to help you create a smooth morning in getting to church so that you can focus, so that you can be with us here? Here's something, I'm, I'm a native Austinite, okay, and so I get that this is not Austin culture. I'll just throw this out. What about showing up a little early so that you can pray so that you can focus on what's happening so you're not coming right through the door and immediately bombarded with everything, right? Without any time to focus. Again, hear me. I'm right there with you doing tech. I'm focusing on so many other things. And so uh, I've learned a lot from what I've been studying this week as well. How about just eating a good breakfast? I don't know about you, but sometimes during the sermon about this time, I start to think, oh, what am I going to have for lunch? What are my dinner plans? And maybe if I just ate a little bit better before I showed up, then that wouldn't happen as much. And finally, I would encourage you to pray before you show up. Just refocus on what we're doing. We are coming before a holy God. And sometimes we use the songs for this, right? We, we come into the room and there's a nice upbeat song that talks about how good God is and that helps us to, to refocus our heart on what we're doing here this morning. But that's not actually what these songs are for, okay? That's, a, that's an awesome byproduct of what happens. We get blessed when we worship God, but if we're using these songs to orient our own hearts, then the songs aren't really about God, they're about us. These songs, when we sing them, are to tell of the glory of our God. So I would encourage you to pray and to focus, to remember why you're here before you show up so that we together, as the body of Christ, are able to sing and proclaim the goodness of God. Pray before you come so that you will be ready to pray when you arrive here and sleep before you come so that you'll stay alert when you're here. Read the scriptures so that your heart will be soft to hear from God as you come before him. And then when that happens, that puts us in a position where we can come hungry to hear from God. We can come and expect that God will speak, that he will change us. We can anticipate the experience that we're gonna have because we have properly prepared for this relationship with the creator of the universe. And all of this might feel like a lot, right? Josh, I have two nights a week that are not school nights, that are not work nights, and I have to give up an entire evening for this, really? What I would say to that is, is it's only a sacrifice if you're focusing on what you're giving up, right? What if we changed our perspective and we started to focus not on the things that we have to give up, but we focus on what God offers to us here, right? When, when we think about setting goals, 
when we think about um, sacrifice, I'd, I'd say like, think of an Olympian, right? As much as the marketing team of McDonald's would like you to believe, I'm sure that they are not chowing down on McDonald's before they are, are performing, right? Before they go to the Olympics. That's not a part of their routine. And they gladly give up those things. They give up junk food. They give up mounds of their time. Their entire life is focused on these Olympic games. And they're not focused on all those things that they give up. They're focused on winning, right? That gold medal before the entire world. They joyfully cut things out of their lives to become the people that they want to be. Right, so let's joyfully prepare to meet with God in worship together. Look at what he offers you. What do we have to gain? God speaking to us. God changing us. God making us more like his people. We have direct access to God and he will speak to us here this morning. When God came in Exodus 19 to the Israelites, he told them to prepare by washing their clothes, right? And that was an outward picture. But now we get to see through Jesus what that picture was pointing towards. That was our righteousness in Christ. And that preparation isn't just about what we wear. It's not about outwardly how we show ourselves to be. Now, because of what we've seen because of what Jesus has done, we understand that this is a change in our hearts, that we are a new creation, that that was just a picture, an outward picture, and now we are able to see what it was pointing towards, our very hearts being changed. And so we prepare, not on the outside. Sure, I would love for you to take a shower before you show up in the morning, but it's not about that. It's about our hearts being prepared before the Lord. It's about prayer and, and setting our entire lives on worship to God so that when we gather together, we're able to receive from him and we're able to give to each other as well. And if you didn't prepare this morning, please don't hear this as guilt or shame. Okay, like I said, I'm right there. I've been there most of the time. <laughs> hear this as an invitation to more. God is willing to give you so much more here this morning. Imagine what God would do in our midst if we all came together as true worshipers, worshiping in spirit and in truth, expecting to hear from him every week, and then going out into the world and making disciples. Imagine what that would look like. Because all of this, all of this has always been about a relationship with God, right? We look all throughout the scriptures and God shows us, he's revealed to us. It, we worship him because we know who he is. We know him personally and that's why we worship him. From the very beginning in Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve, he puts them in the Garden of Eden. And the scripture says that the Lord was walking in the garden with them. There was that relationship there. God could show himself, reveal himself in that way. But because of the sin of mankind, man was banished from the garden. God took him out of that relationship because <laughs> the entrance of sin into our hearts made it so that we would be destroyed before God. God warned us, if we sin, we will die. So he banished us from the garden so that we wouldn't die. But God still wanted to be with his people, so he set up these sacrificial systems where we kill animals so that we're able to see what our sin does. We're able to see that we need a sacrifice, that we need atonement for our rebellion but then, the Bible says, at the fullness of time, God sent his son, Jesus, to die for us, to take the punishment for sin that we deserved. And Christ's body on the cross, when he was nailed to the cross, 
It was symbolically torn for us. And the veil in the temple was torn as well. And now we have access to God. Now we can come before him without fear. Hebrews, once again, going back to that book, it says that we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that was opened up for us through the curtain that is his body. We don't enter, we don't have to enter through that veil that was in the Holy of Holies. We enter in through Jesus Christ himself. All of these sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were just a foreshadowing of the perfect sacrifice to come. The Holy Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. And now the Holy of Holies, the place where God dwells, the very presence of God that again burns like fire, that comes in a trumpet blast, an earthquake, that presence of God is now open to all who have faith in Jesus. There's a song that we sing um, that I think uh, encapsulates this really well. And so I'd like to just read you uh, the verse before we sing it together. It says, who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from heaven, from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I'm forgiven. The king of kings calls me his own. Beautiful savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. We say here at Austin Oaks that we want you to meet, to know, and to follow Jesus. So this morning, if you haven't met him before, I would encourage you to do so. See what he's done for you, meet him. And if you've met him and you don't know him, he wants to know you. He wants a relationship with you. And if you know him, and right now you're just not following him, this is an invitation to more. He wants you to follow him, and he is giving so much for you. Let's worship him together. Let's pray. Lord God, you are so holy. You are so powerful and great. You strike fear into our hearts when we actually begin to see and think the creator of the universe, the one who spoke everything into being, and yet you call us your own. You call us your beloved. You invite us in to know you personally. Let's not take that for granted. Let's not take what we do here together for granted. But let's look to you. Let's receive your mercy and your grace. We praise you, God, for you are altogether good. And we sing your praises here together as your body. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.